Today we're talking about the power of routine, about setting cues together to form the painting habit. So if you were with me right at the beginning of today's broadcast, I talked a little bit about the challenges I faced eight years ago when I began to have way more administrative work at the college than I had time for in order to keep painting. So I had to come up with a new routine. I couldn't paint in the afternoon anymore, but I had about an hour and a half, two hours after I got home where I could paint before I had to go to bed to get some sleep. So what I started doing was to set up on my washing machine in my laundry room where I could paint a small four by six inch painting every day. And then I added a little to the challenge by making myself paint with a painting knife, which was something I really had not done before then. I'd painted for almost 30 years by that point, but not with a knife, mainly with a brush. Those first ones were ugly. They were what I call my gloopy paintings, but I did it anyway, and I kept going. And even more importantly, for accountability, I told my friends and family what I was doing and posted them on the internet every day, even the bad ones. So for 90 days, I did a painting a day, four by six inches with my painting knife. And I painted the area that I saw every day. So I wasn't going out and looking for some sort of fantastic new ideal subject. I painted what I saw. So it was straightforward. And little bit by little bit by little bit, I climbed out of the funk that I had been in at the loss of my old painting routine. And I developed a new one, a new one that actually fit and worked and put me in a whole nother position. So that is the process that I started sharing with you in the five day painting challenge. The power of doing small paintings, a small thing a day, working towards your goal of having a consistent painting practice. Because as Chuck Close said, the power is in showing up. One of life's ironies is that all of us, including artists, work better within a discipline or a framework. When we have a discipline or a framework, then we can be free. So a lot of people think of artists, the stereotype is that we're these flaky people that come in, stare at our pennies a little bit, throw a couple of pieces of paint, pieces, throw a couple of strokes of paint onto the canvas, drink a little wine, then go out and party all night. That is not the advice, is that it takes a disciplined practice in order to be successful. So you need to think about creating a structure or a box, a framework within which to paint freely. Our brains, our conscious brains, remember, only have the capability of processing a very limited number of decisions a day. So if we can facilitate those, that decision-making process and make it easier by going on autopilot when we paint, then we get into flow so much more easily. And we can paint responsively, we can paint intuitively, and we can paint confidently without fear. So that's the magic awesome sauce to painting without fear, to painting confidently, is to getting into flow state. It's not painting just for 20 or 30 minutes a day. It's about painting in flow. Now, after you do a daily painting project for long enough, and it doesn't have to be at that point 20 or 30 minutes a day, you won't have any trouble getting into flow because you'll have that habit or routine developed. But you have to set the stage for that by creating a routine intentionally and consciously. So how do you do that? Remember we talked yesterday about cues and triggers. Cues are the things that appeal to sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Those are the things that appeal to senses. They get into your brain through a very, very basic reptilian pathway through our, our reptilian brain. And it lets us know that it's time to do what we were getting ready to do. It's time to follow, fall into place on that routine. So the triggers I use when I come in the studio, the cues that tell me it's time to paint, a, I walk through the door and I'm surrounded by my materials, my tools, and my work. 
So I see my paintings on the wall. I see my tools on the work surface. I see my brushes, my knives, and most of all, because I love looking at color, I see my tubes of paint. Looking at the colors on the tubes gets my creative juices flowing. Then I look at the work that I did the day before. All of that is appealing to my eye. Then the next thing I do is I put my apron over my head. I've had an apron that I use in the studio for decades. I've had to replace it and get a new one, but I've had a denim apron ever since. It's part of my routine. If I don't have it, it feels funny. So I put the apron on. Again, touch. I'm feeling it. The feel of the apron when I tie it around my back. Then next, I make my coffee my decaf, and it's the smell and the taste. So it's appealing to my the sense of smell and to the taste. I sit in my chair, sip my coffee, and look at what I did the day before and think about what I need to do next. So it's a very set routine. Then I put on my music. Plus one for Greg Allman and Low Country Blues, because that gets me going when I'm painting Southern landscapes. But that pattern is duplicable no matter where I am. I can follow that routine no matter what studio I'm painting in, what environment I'm painting in. If I do just a couple of those things, it'll begin to trigger the desire to get in there and go to work. So having a routine is not confining at all. It is actually very freeing. So think of the routine as the box, the safety net, the frame which, within which you're going to create. So having a routine sets you free. If you don't remember anything else from the challenge, this is what I want you to remember, that having a routine will set you free. So take what we're going on over during this five-day challenge at the end of it, I want you to hold on to what works for you. I want you to add in other things. That's part of that reflection that we're going to talk about on Monday. But you need to develop your own routine. This is just the quick start. You need to work on a routine for more than five days in order for it to become a habit. So routines become habits when they're repeated over enough time. And that time frame is longer than five days. It really does take at least 21 days to begin to set a routine. And if you skip a day, it becomes really hard to get back in until it's a habit. So routine and habit are not exactly the same thing. A routine is when you repeat those cues over and over in a set pattern. A habit is when you repeat the routine long enough that it's habitual, that you don't have to think about it, that it just occurs. So we wanna to get to that habitual stage from the routine stage. Got it? So we're gonna work on stacking those cues. So I'm gonna pull my phone down in just a second so that I can see y'all's questions because I can see the comments coming in and I can't read them and it's frustrating me. But I'm gonna get up there and look at those in just a second and we'll answer some of those questions. But I want you to think about, and hopefully everybody did their homework yesterday and figured out a cue for each of those senses. If you haven't done it yet, get on it. Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. You need to appeal to all of those senses, whatever it is that works for you. The touch part and the sight part might be getting your materials out and setting up. The touch part might be mixing paint. That's definitely one of my touch parts. The act of mixing my paint before I start to paint begins to really make my creative juices flow. It's just like smelling food cooking gets your taste buds activated and makes you salivate. Well, mixing paint makes me salivate. That's where I want you to get to. And when you repeat those things over and over, you're gonna form the painting habit yourself. And then you'll have established that first step, that first leg actually in the thriving artist's stool. Remember, I've used that metaphor of the stool before. 
that you have to have a three-legged stool in order for it to be stable. A two-legged stool wobbles back and forth. A one-legged stool wobbles all the way around. And I want all of y'all to develop a three-legged stool for your painting practice, no matter what your success path or goal is. So we wanna get those awesome paintings coming out of that established routine and habit, the habit-forming studio routine. So let's get going on that. And I'm gonna pull the phone down right now, so you may get a little dizzy here, sorry about that. And take a look at the questions that have come in. So let me sit down here for a sec where I can see what everybody is saying. And, oh, it's gonna go way back here. Hey, Leslie, it's good to see you. And Yvonne and Cindy, glad y'all found me again after the first one went kabooey. Don't know what happened on that, but the signal stopped and then it was not there anymore. So when there's a will, there's a way. And hey, Lori, it's good to see you. And Ginger Box is here too. Ginger says, glad you're back, learning and loving it. The first challenge I participated in, and Ginger did the first, one of the first ones that we did back in January of 2018. She says was a first with the palette knife for her. And she didn't give up and now loves painting with a palette knife. Thank, oh, thank you, Ginger. I'm so glad that that's worked out so well for you. And kudos, my friend, because I know you've started selling your paintings now after going through the challenge several times. And I am really, really proud of what you've been able to accomplish. It's awesome sauce. Hey, Diane, it's great to see you. And Brenda and Kathy Prince. Kathy says, when you paint daily, do you use canvas, panels, or something more affordable? Um, when I'm doing a 20 minute painting as a warm up, I tend to use um, a panel, like an ampersand panel. I also sometimes prep my own panels and that makes it a little bit affor more affordable. But if you're worried about making it, um, or you're trying to be more priced conscious, let me see if I can get the phone out where I can hold it a little bit better. One of the things I recommend to my students is that they use the Arches oil paper. The Arches oil paper, if you're painting in oils, or you can use just paper that's gessoed if you're working in acrylics. Paper's cheaper than canvas or panels, and so it takes away the preciousness of it and makes you a little bit freer with your materials. So working with paper can be a real um, boon that way. Another thing about the Arches oil paper is you can cut it to size, whatever size you wanna work with. You don't have to prep it. If you're working in oils, you can just dive right in. So I would suggest using the oil paper. So that is my fav one of my favorite things to paint on. But when I'm doing those little paintings, I'm using um, four by six inch panels. And I'm looking over at my easel to see if I have any over there. I will walk with y'all for just a minute over here and grab one of the panels out of my storage room, which is a hot mess. I hope Stephanie can't see it because she would fuss. And let y'all see one of these little panels. They look really similar to the big one that's behind. Here it is, let me back it up a little bit so you can see it. It's a cradled panel. That's one of the type that I use. Um, the others are just the straight ampersand panels because I sell those small ones and so they end up paying for themselves. So, but if you're just getting started, then I would highly recommend the Arches oil paper. It works really, really well. Hey, Lori Lamb. Tori Rowland, good morning to you. She says, can you show more how you use your colors? Do you buy a lot of pre-mixed or do you mix your own? Tori, I do not buy a whole lot of premixed colors. I mainly use a double primary palette. I use a couple of secondary colors as well. And there is a blog post on my website about the double primary palette and which paint colors I use. So I'll try to remember to drop that back into the comments here once we hop off. But the colors that I use are ultramarine blue, Thalo Blue, Yellow Ochre, Indian Yellow, Naphthal Red, 
and crimson. And then I use white. That's pretty much it. Then there's some secondaries, the convenience colors that I use as well. Um, and all of these, most of these are Williamsburg. So the Indian yellow um, from Williamsburg is really, really gorgeous. And then I use Gamblin's Flake White Replacement, which is a titanium white. Um, another color I use all the time, even though it's a convenience color, is Italian Terra Verde. And another I use frequently is Montserrat Orange from Williamsburg and their Egyptian Violet, which is gorgeous. But the reality is if you're using a double primary palette, you don't have to use anything else because from that you can mix everything else on the color wheel. So that's really freeing. And when I'm going out painting plein air, I do not want to haul 20 pounds worth of paint. So I tend to mix my paint myself. It's just part of my process. Uh, and as far as mixing, deciding how much to mix, it depends on the size of the panel. So if I'm working on a four by six inch one, I might mix about uh, paint that's about the size of a quarter. So I mix all my colors ahead of time before I start painting. And so it will look like the size of a quarter. If I'm working on one the size of the painting behind me, it's gonna be four times that amount of paint. So you just increase the amount of paint depending on the size of the panel or the canvas. Most of that is gonna be dependent on how thickly you paint. And you're gonna learn how much to mix and how much to use from actually doing it. There's, there's really no other replacement for experience. You need that experience to decide how much to use. So I hope that helps. But I'll post the link to the double primary palette once I hop off. Um, Yvonne says, what colors does your palette mostly consist of? Okay, that's the same question that we just got. So I think I've answered that. Um, yeah, exactly. I love the Williamsburg Montserrat Orange, Egyptian Violet, and Terra Verde. Those are always, almost always out. Uh, some other colors that they have that are occasional visitors. Cinnabar Green Light, Permanent Green Light, um, Italian Brown Pink. Oh, Azo Orange from, I think that's M. Graham and Company. So any of those. I, I like to use really, really good paint. So I mainly use Williamsburg and Gamblin. Use some Vasari. Um, Blue Ridge Oil, Michael Harding, any of those really, really good quality paints are worth using, but you get what you pay for with paint. It's more pure pigment when you pay more for it. So you don't save anything. Oops, pulled up the wrong thing here. You don't save anything by buying student grade paint. Please don't do that, y'all. Mike says, I've got my brush out of the box and canvas on the easel. Yay, Mike, way to go. I love hearing that. Kathy says, I believe you're right about the routine, consistency, and commitment is the best way to succeed. That's where I'm heading upon retirement, but impossible before then. The day is coming soon. Yeehaw! Kathy, I didn't get there right away. It took me, it took me a few years. So the first thing I established, and my, one of my goals is to speed that process up for y'all. So it took me probably... It took me almost exactly six years from when I first decided I needed to move to a more online business presence because the galleries all closed, and or a lot of galleries closed, and 2010 came along during the Great Recession, and nobody around here sold anything through the galleries. The galleries were having a hard time staying afloat. They did, mine did, but it was touch and go there. And I decided I was not ever gonna be in that position again, that I was not gonna be dependent on one channel for income in addition to my college teaching. And that was when I also started doing the daily paintings. And it took me, because I was kind of finding my own way until 2015, when I realized I was making enough from the online business to be able to leave college teaching. So it can take four or five years. Um, it doesn't have to take that much for people now because there's so many other people out there 
ahead of you who've made that transition. So look around for other role models who are just a little ahead of you and you can find your way. Yay, Laura, she says, I enjoy watching pe people mix paint. Me too, I love watching people mix paint and I love mixing paint. Hey Julie, it's good to see you. And Fran Layton says, the quiet and morning light pulls me into my painting room. You, you're, you're most welcome for the advice. Yeah, I think the having a room that inspires you, it doesn't have to be a picture perfect studio. It has to be your perfect studio. So if the light is fantastic, that's gonna help. If the um, tools are easy to use, that's gonna help. But what your studio looks like is really very personal and up to you. Judy says, I'm enjoying the challenge. Thank you for doing this. I am so glad, Judy. I hope that it takes you far and fast. And Kathy says, thanks for the paper suggestion. You are most welcome. Hey, Barb. And hey, Ron Dudley. Lisa says, thanks for doing this. And Nadia says, hey there, are those panels treated before you paint on them? They sure are. I use shellac, my arm's getting a little tired there, sorry about that. Um, I use shellac on them. It is a natural product, as those of you who know anything about shellac know, it's made from bug exoskeletons, and it's pretty archival too. I've talked with a friend of mine who's a conservator about doing, using that. So I prep my panels with shellac first, and what the shellac does is it seals the wood so the oil from the paint can't get into the wood and deteriorate it, and the acid from the wood can't get into the oil and deteriorate it, so it's a barrier. And then you can gesso that surface and paint right on it like any other. Don't ever put shellac on canvas, though. So yeah, you have to prepare, prepare a raw piece of wood by working on the front, back, and sides with shellac. Gesso is not enough to seal it. Julia says, what color do you, did you use to tone the canvas that I just held up? Well, now that one was toned with the shellac, but usually I use yellow ochre to tone my canvases because it's the color of the light here in the southeast. So I use really thin yellow ochre. Yay, Tori, I'm glad that was helpful. Dee Dee says, how do you make black? Ah, Dee Dee noticed that I didn't have black on my list of colors. Well done. So I mix my darks, and there are a couple of different combinations that I really, really like a lot. One is the Italian Terra Verde and the Violet. That makes a really sumptuous, rich, dark color. Another really great dark is made with crimson and green. So you could take the Terra Verde and mix crimson in, and it would do it. You can use a phthalo blue, and it'll do it. So I mix my darks from close complements that are really transparent, and that makes a really, really, really rich dark. You can use black, but you need to use it really carefully. And because I'm a colorist, and I'm dealing a lot with optical color, I don't wanna use tube black. It's not as rich as the black that I mix. Shannon Sandoval, how are you? She says, how do you decide what color to use for shadows? I do it based on the time of year and the color of the light. So shadow colors are in general, the complement of the color of the light. So that's what I tend to go with. Here in the Southeast, it tends to be violet in the fall, uh, more ultramarine blue in the winter, uh, more red violet in the spring, and uh, phthalo blue in the summer, but that's real general. Tori says, do you exclusively, uh, can't talk, exclusively paint in oils? I'm currently working in acrylics. What brands would you recommend? Um, I work in whatever's gonna get the effect that I'm after. So I started out as a watercolorist early, early on. That was my first medium, and then acrylic, and then oil. But I've taught in all three. I mainly, at this point, work in oils because of their flexibility. For acrylics, I recommend Golden. 
I, I don't think they can be beat. That's the only acrylic paint I use is Golden. I like their products. Uh, for watercolor, I love Daniel Smith's watercolors. They're exquisite. So those are my favorites and the other mediums that I use. I also use pastels and love, love, love them. And there are a whole host of fantastic pastel products to work from. Leslie says, the routine of painting daily is helping me a lot. I am so glad. One of the things I want y'all to think about doing after that is then to begin build, building a routine around those other areas of the artwork living framework that you want to have routines around what you're going to do to move down your success path, to implement those business practices, and to implement those fun practices, the creativity practices, the imagination practices as well. Nadia says, does shellac, does any shellac work? Yes, it does. Um, there, I don't know that there are that many brands out there. The only one I've seen here in the Southeast is Zinzer, and it's just regular plain old shellac. It comes in clear and amber, either one will work. So you get that at Home Depot, Lowe's, or your building supply store. Doesn't have to be anything special and it'll be fine. Cool. I'm glad you're going to work on it this week, Trina. Um, for pastels, I would have to pull a book back out um, because there are so many that I would want to think about that for a second first. Do, it depends on whether you want the hard or the soft pastels, too. Um, I love the Sennelier. They're wonderful. Off the top of my head, that's what I would recommend. Yay, Tori says she got golden. Excellent. Those are my favorite um, acrylics. Judy says, can you mix regular oil paints with water-soluble ones? Um, let me talk about the water-soluble ones for just a second. Uh, a lot of people buy the water-soluble ones because they're concerned about um, health and safety with the oil paint. And in truth, oil paints are the most natural and the safest of all the mediums. Pastel is the most dangerous because all of those pigments go airborne. So what makes oils a little bit less safe and a little bit more toxic is not the paint that comes in the tube at all. It's the solvent that people use with it. Eliminate solvents and you've eliminated 90% of the health risk associated with oil paints. If you then eliminate some of the heavy metals, like the cobalts and the cadmiums, you've gotten rid of 99.99% .99 of the things that can be problematic. Water-soluble oils are no more safe than regular oils. Not at all. The only difference is you don't use solvents with them. You can mix water-soluble oils with regular oils, but understand when you do that, you lose the water-soluble part of it. So you need to, at that point, treat them like regular oil paints. The problem I have with water-soluble, and I use them for making monotypes, but not to paint with very much. And the problem that I have with them is that water-solubles have a really weird consistency because they have been manipulated chemically so that they have water mixed in with the oil. And you know water and oil don't like each other. And the other problem I have with them is that there are a more limited range of colors available at times, and some of my favorite colors are not in there. Um, but if they work for you, keep using them. The best brands are ones like Royal Talons. Um, Holbin has a fantastic line of water solubles. But yes, you can mix them with regular ones, but then they need to be treated like regular oils. So I think I have caught all of the questions there. Looking back through, and I don't think I have skipped any. Kudos for y'all chasing after me and finding me when once the first thread died and I picked up the second one. It's been great having y'all here this morning. So I want to recap really quickly what we covered today. We talked again about the overall idea of the three-legged stool, that you want to develop that really solid painting practice so that you can make awesome paintings, a consistent, regular painting practice that's based on the habit of painting, 
Then you want to identify your idea of success, your success path, and what impact you want to make on the world, and learn the business strategies that are going to help you get there. You want to create an, or establish a creative life that's going to feed your imagination. Remember to enfold, play, and fun. It'll make you a better painter. Then to develop that painting habit, establish cues that you stack together to form a routine. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about the power of rewards, about one of my favorite topics, Circe's. So if you don't know what a Circe is, it's a Southernism. It's a deep South Southernism. It's what we call small gifts and presents. Usually small gifts and presents that aren't really looked for. They just happen. So I want you to give yourself a Circe at the end of the challenge, and I want you to think about how you can fold rewards into your routine. So take care, everybody. Happy painting. Until tomorrow, dive in there. Get down to day number three. Bye-bye for now.